On Belfast streets I've heard it said They're shooting little children dead Taking life hardly begun With plastic bullets from their guns We won't be kept down easy We will not be still we won't be kept down easy for the maim and kill. Young Carol on twelve years of age, shut down by Brits in bloody rage. We duty live in stone as well. Velvet their plastic hell and we won't be kept down easy we will not be still we won't be kept down easy for all the They tried to make us toe their line By using every type of crime But freedom won't be terrorized Nor freedom struggle through life uh, We won't be kept down easy We will not be still we won't be kept down easy from being killed. They tried to drag us from our streets by taking life so young and sweet. Do they not know we'll not be beat? Their violence is a road to peace. We won't be kept down easy. We will not be still. We won't be kept down easy. We're all the same We won't be kept down easy. We will not be. We won't be kept down easy. I forgot the name and kill. I forgot the name and kill. I forgot the name and kill. In 1967, the police in Hong Kong, a British colony, developed a method of striking demonstrators with a wooden button round. It was made of teak, weighted with a metal core, and fired from a gun. It could cause serious injuries, both from impact and splintering. However, despite this and the killing of a girl, they were regarded as a success by the British authorities. The next year, 1968, on October the 5th, a civil rights march was viciously attacked by the RUC, the Royal Ulster Constabulary, in Derry City. The civil rights demonstrators were calling for one man, one vote, and equality of employment and housing, which were denied to the Catholic nationalist community by the Loyalist government of Northern Ireland. The television cameras were there, and for the first time, relayed to a startled and amazed worldwide audience an exposition of the blatant sectarianism of the Stormont government and its agents, the RUC. The campaign intensified. On the 1st of January the following year, a small group of students, members of the Civil Rights Association, left Belfast to march to Derry. At Bruntollet Bridge, they were attacked by a group of B-specials, 
the Loyalist Police Reserve, who were organised but felt it necessary not to wear their uniforms. The RUC stood by. When the march eventually reached Derry, they were again attacked by Loyalists and the RUC. The bogside area of the city threw up barricades. They resisted the police baton charges, water cannon attacks and a bombardment of CS gas. The Battle of the Bogside lasted a week and the world watched. Because of the adverse publicity the RUC were getting and the relative unreliability of the wooden baton round developed in Hong Kong, it was felt by the authorities that its introduction would not be opportune. The British government's chemical research establishment at Porton Down conducted a crash programme to produce a projectile, which was thought to have a more acceptable image, the rubber bullet. It was six inches long, one and a half inches in diameter, and weighed five ounces. It was first introduced in the New Lodge area of Belfast in August 1970. The nationalist demands for reform did not slacken, and their nationalist aspirations grew. This severely threatened the stability of the Stormont government. Prime Minister Faulkner sought and received military support from the British government to introduce internment. On the 9th of August 1971, hundreds of nationalists were rounded up and imprisoned without trial. Internment was to last for the next four years. The 9th of August was to be remembered by the nationalist population. Raids by the British Army became commonplace as the numbers of those imprisoned rose from hundreds to thousands. Emma Groves, a resident of Anderson's town in Belfast, tells of such a raid. Well, um, it was on the 4th of November of uh, 1971 and um, the British Army had been in the district raiding houses in the early hours of the morning which is the usual time for the British Army to raid houses anyway, like. So all the children had about got out of bed, and um, the army just went through the whole house, round second, pulling everything apart. And as I'm the mother of 11 children, and the youngest at that time was five, it was very annoying, and the children were very upset. But um, during that time, there had been arresting a few of the men in the street, so one of the men, two doors from me, had been arrested and he was the father of four or five young children and the children were in a very bad state and the wee wife was crying. So I ran down to see what I could do and uh, give her some tea and tablets and try to comfort her and the children. And then I heard, oh, here's the powers in. And, uh, and they were in all right because they came in with a lot of aggression and ordered everybody into their own homes. So I had to leave the wee woman and go back up into my own house. So we were all put under house arrest. And uh, a soldier was put in every doorway. And I've been told later that the whole district was actually surrounded by the Paris and there was nobody getting in or out of the district. So I just pulled up the finishing blinds, which everybody else in the street had done. Where I was looking over the opposite side of the street and we're all standing looking out of our windows. And it was very, very frustrating to watch because there were trailing young men and boys from their homes, some on their bare feet, some with just their shirts and trousers on. And it was very, as I say, very frustrating to watch. Mm-hmm. Didn't know why to scream or cry or what to do, but you seemed so helpless. And so I said to my daughter, for God's sake, put on a record or something to build up our morale because this is terrible. So she put on the record for Green Fields. And it was only planned minutes. And it's a very nice Irish ballad, the Four Green Fields. And uh, the bullet comes through the window and shot me. And I lost both eyes. So, like, my whole children, the youngest were five and experienced all this, so it was horrific for them to have to put up with that. Well, anyway, I was taken to the hospital and nothing could be done because 
both my eyes were completely destroyed. And um, at the minute, and since I have been wearing artificial eyes, these, the bullet, you see, must have just scrimmed across my eyes and this part of my nose. This is all plastic surgery. And um, so when I was told in the hospital that I would never see again, I just wanted to die. The British had now developed a two-pronged attack on the nationalists. The first, imprisonment without trial. The second, the use of weapons to terrorise the population to implement the former. Between 1970 and 1975, when rubber bullets were withdrawn, three people were killed and countless injured. It has been argued that rubber and plastic bullets are safer than lead bullets. However, it must be remembered that it is not a policy of rubber and plastic bullets instead of lead bullets, but a policy of rubber and plastic bullets and lead bullets. Despite the increasing use of rubber bullets, more and more people demonstrated against internment. A large rally was called on Sunday the 30th of January 1972 in Derry. Get down, get down. Fourteen innocent people were killed by lead bullets. A study carried out by four surgeons from the Royal Victoria Hospital in Belfast on rubber bullet victims was severely critical of their use. Three of the cases were of severe brain damage. One of these was Francis Rowntree, aged 11, who died on the 23rd of April 1972 after being struck on the head by a rubber bullet three days before at Divis Flats. It was fired by a soldier of the Royal Anglian Regiment from inside a Saracen armoured vehicle. Eyewitnesses said that the bullet had been doctored. It had been hacked in half, with a torch battery replacing the missing half. Well, when, when, when Never Frank was killed, it was 1972, and he was the first one killed with these rubber bullets and at that time nobody ever thought that they would kill that, that anybody could be killed with them they were only a deterrent for riot situations but when when frank was killed with it uh, the doctors in the royal hospital and uh, a lot of people were concerned at the time and they they said that the damage that was done to him with this, that they would maybe try and get them banned. But they've brought in these other ones, which is even more lethal. And the uh, Mr. Rutherford, uh, the surgeon in the Royal, said that there was absolutely no chance of saving him, but Frank, because the, the, his whole brain was damaged and his eyesight was... He would have been blind if he had survived it. In the summer of 1972, the Belfast surgeons handed the report over to army surgeons. The army suppressed it, publishing it as a restricted document for internal use. It was not until the Sunday Times published a leaked account of it in May 1973 that the surgeons were finally told they could publish without the risk of prosecution under the Official Secrets Act. Two more people were to die from rubber bullets. Tobias Malloy from Straban was struck in the heart in the early hours of Sunday the 16th of July 1972 by a rubber bullet fired at point-blank range by soldiers near a British Army checkpoint on the border. He was returning across the border from a dance in County Donegal some youths had been throwing stones at the soldiers, but Tobias's friends said that he had nothing to do with the trouble. Rubber bullets were fired during his funeral procession, injuring a woman and two youths. Thomas Friel, aged 21, was hit on the head at around midnight on the 17th of May 1973 by a rubber bullet fired by British soldiers. Thomas was on his way home to the Cregan Heights in Derry with his brother, who said that, although there had been rioting earlier, the area was quiet at the time of the shooting. 
Rubber bullets were eventually phased out and replaced by plastic bullets. Some observers have said that this was due to the public outcry and the publication of the surgeon's report. Others have said that rubber bullets were withdrawn because they were unstable in flight and therefore unpredictable, dangerous, and likely to hit and kill innocent bystanders. No doubt public outrage and bad publicity does affect the British government, but the chief reason for the introduction of the plastic bullet was its accuracy, not because it was safer. By the end of July 1981, there had been one death for every 4,000 plastic rounds fired, compared with one for every 18,000 rubber ones. Exactly four and a half times more accurate, dangerous and deadly. The plastic round is slightly lighter in weight and shorter in length than the rubber bullet. But it is harder, and unlike the rubber round, is fired directly at the person. The rubber round was supposed to be ricocheted off the ground in front of a rioter. The plastic round leaves the riot gun at an appreciably higher speed than the rubber bullet. It is about the same weight as a cricket ball and fired at about twice the speed of the fastest fast bowler. Cricket batsmen, strong and extremely fit athletes, face such a bowler with a crash helmet, extensive padding and a box. They defend themselves with a bat and have two umpires to make sure the bowler does not fire the ball at their person. Stephen Geddes was the first to die after being struck by a plastic bullet. Like Francis Rowntree, the first person to be killed by a rubber bullet, he was fired upon by the Royal Anglian Regiment near his home at Divis Flats in Belfast. A very quiet child, he had refused to go outside for three weeks since returning from an NSPCC-sponsored trip to America. On the 28th of August 1975, his father persuaded him to go out to play. About 50 yards from where he was playing, an army patrol were attempting to remove two cushions which some boys had set far to in the road. The boys stoned the soldiers, one of whom who gave chase and fired a plastic round. Stephen fell to the ground with a head wound. Eyewitnesses emphatically deny Stephen was involved. He died two days later. He was ten years old. On the 4th of October 1976, Brian Stewart left his homework, nipped out of the house to buy sweets at a nearby corner shop. He was standing outside the shop with a small group of children when a British Army foot patrol was passing. A plastic round was discharged and Brian fell to the ground. Six days after Brian was shot, he died. He was aged 13. His mother, Mrs. Kathleen Stewart. The following day, the, a major appeared on television being interviewed. He said that Bram was the ringleader of a riot and mob of 400 and he had watched him for a considerable time and they shot at a Pacific, Pacific target. Uh, at the inquest, the same major that came out with the statement on television said that Brian was standing with the group of 15 youths and that Brian wasn't the target that the shot was aimed at but a tall youth with a blue and white strip jumper which contradicted the, the interview that went out over uh, the television. Uh, overnight, my family became terrorists. My son became a terrorist. And the army harassed me and uh, my children whenever they went out in the street. In fact, at one point in time, they beat me up about the face and I lost all my teeth. My 15-year-old daughter was arrested and brought to Castlereagh. My 17-year-old daughter was arrested. My husband was arrested. My son was arrested. And there was no charges at any time because we weren't involved in any organisations or, or interested in politics. Um, I, I took out a civil action against the soldier that shot Brian 
And in the court, there was only uh, the, the soldier that shot him, a witness for the Ministry of Defence, and he said that they were being uh, harassed by 250. So the, this was a contradictory story again. And um, he didn't know the instructions of firing the plastic bullet gun. This was five years after my son had been murdered. And I thought that was terrible. But the judge commented him on being uh, a very competent soldier, although he didn't know the instructions of firing the plastic bullet. Uh, I mean, I know my son was innocent. I know there was no riot at the time that he was shot. I know that I didn't get justice going through the courts. Michael Donnelly, who lived in the university area of the city, was a dedicated community worker. In the early hours of the morning of the 9th of August, 1980, he heard of rioting in the vicinity of his mother's home in the Falls area of the city, on a local radio. His mother had been ill, so he decided, even at that late hour, to try to get across the city to see if his mother was all right. Deliberately avoiding a British Army roadblock, he went a roundabout route, but came across a foot patrol who were firing plastic rounds indiscriminately down Leeson Street. He was struck and died almost instantly from lacerations and bruising to his left lung. Michael was 21. His mother, Mrs. Mary Donnelly. Michael was, uh, well, he was, jo he was jolly. He was good. He was good sport. And um, he thought not helping with the welfare you know that welfare handicaps, teenagers and stuff like that. And at that particular time, it was say it was helping out with you know the battered ways children. And he done a lot of work for them. And um, they sort of way down and out. So at that particular time, they had a place open for the you know the down and outs. They worked through the night. Give them its dinner and stuff. I think it's closed down now. And, uh, no, going to different welfare centres and helping out there. 